friend. It's amazing. Uh, so let me give you a little, little uh, perspective on what hurricane life was like uh, 20 years ago. It was really very different uh, than now. I grew up in, in Melbourne area and studying ecology in Florida State. So it wasn't like I was not familiar with hurricanes and, and the hurricane threat uh, in Florida. I lived in Florida State two years ago, actually, in the media lab, Melbourne Beach area. But the fact is that uh, when we moved to Miami in 1983, there was a sense that hurricanes didn't really happen much anymore. And by the late 80s, uh, it was very firmly established that hurricanes didn't happen anymore. But during the 80s, uh, I was working for the ABC station at the time, and every day I get a story about something going on in South Florida. And a lot of the stories uh, I actually research at these, uh, the historical museum of South Florida. And when you study the history of Miami and South Florida, you can't help but study hurricanes. And one of the things that I learned during that time in the ABC, and that was about to five and a half years, was that. Downtown Miami actually had the eye pass over, the eye of hurricane pass over downtown Miami, not somewhere in Miami, Dade County, not somewhere in Broad County, but downtown Miami six times in the 20th century. 1906, 1926, 35, 15, 15, 74. That doesn't count the category of North uh, North of Fort Lauderdale, doesn't count uh, later Andrew, it doesn't count 45 category three in South Bay. It doesn't count a whole lot of them, but uh, six times the eye went over downtown Miami. And then when, when uh, I was hired by NBC to be the chief meteorologist, I thought, you know what? Uh, this is a hurricane from the place. I don't care what these people said. And uh, if we have another one of these uh, storms, people are going to look at me and say, okay, well, what do we do about this? So that was one thing uh, that happened in my life. Another thing that happened was the television station, the NBC station, where I brought through new management. And they wanted to revamp the weather department. They wanted something new and different and uh, move forward and be more modern. And I said, why don't we do hurricanes? And they agreed. And they uh, created a thing called the Storm Center, which I designed. And uh, uh, TV folks would not be able to believe this, but they assigned me a full-time producer to work with me. And we did stories, and many of those were about hurricanes. We went out and we covered all of those old hurricanes, every one we could find. And we went out and we talked to everybody we could think of including Kate, and including uh, Bob Sheets, and including the phone company, and the school board, and the Coast Guard, and everybody else in both Miami Dade Broward and the Keys, also, uh, I don't want to forget, the Monroe County, and Billy Wagner, about what would we do as a community if a hurricane happened. And we did that as part of a, a television station-wide effort to, uh, to really market the television station and make the weather effort uh, have more more uh, oomph to it and, and have more, uh, more, be more substantial. So uh, all of that was going on beginning in the 1990s. And the television station also from a management standpoint put a lot of effort behind preparedness. So we were positioned for a set of reasons uh, better than I think any television station ever had been for a hurricane to happen and then this alleged hurricane happened. And, and I thought about about a variety of things. One was, uh, and most importantly, I thought a lot, started thinking a lot about the idea of risk. And what do you do about people's risk, community risk? How do you deal with that? That's different than the odds of a hurricane coming, right? It, it's because if you have a, a really vulnerable place like South Florida, the risk can be very high even when the odds are low. So I had this sort of vague notion in my mind as we moved into the middle of uh, 1992 and then to August, and no hurricanes were happening, nothing was really happening, and then along comes this very weak system, and of course they are the name of the Now Gary, now Gary, so let me take you to a Wednesday, August 19th, and the message of that Wednesday was, if it survives, and the message of that Wednesday was, if it survives, uh, I included the water vapor there on the white so you can kind of see what the weather pattern was. You could see the water vapor, but we didn't have enough to bring on television at the time. It was big upper low above what that messy little block there was that was called the uh, Tropic Storm Andrew. And as I said, I, I, I thought a lot about the risk and uh, ended up talking with a guy named Charlie Newman, who uh, you folks associated with the Hurricane Center for many years ago. Charlie was instrumental in developing the early models and just about anything that happened with the Hurricane Center. 
And Charlie and I set up uh, the idea of uh, ellipses around forecast points. So for the first time, we showed what became the cone. Uh, there for Hurricane Andrew, there you see the uh, early cone, which was a really a series of dashed lines that were based on average errors that Charlie had calculated. It was a very subjective kind of thing, and it wasn't like, uh, you know, it wasn't all objectified like it is uh, today. But the idea was to, to show that there was risk to South Florida, and another way we showed that there was risk is we put all the weekend forecasts to watch Andrew. And you know, these were kind of new ideas that came out of this thinking of two and a half years of really talking to everybody in South Florida. But the fact is that on that Wednesday, we were saying it could happen, but you know what, the risk is not very high. The odds are that it's going to go to Florida, like they all do. All our things turned before they get to Florida, and that was the end of the thinking at that time. Then the next day comes, and we look at this at 11 a.m., the what was called the intergovernmental, because there was some time where the discussion was called. They were unable to locate the center. Recon was unable to locate the center. Now, I put the spaghetti plots on the left there. We, as a television station, did not see those spaghetti plots. And actually, I'll talk more about this uh, tomorrow about what they could see and what they knew and what the meteorology was. I just put it there so you could get an idea and see where the 70 bar of forecast position was, where the exits there, uh, yeah, the northeast of the Bahamas, where the very actual uh, ended up the position was part of the last course. But the fact was that the forecast was not a fourth turn, there was no center film. We really were not thinking that the risk had increased at all on Thursday. Remember, this is going to happen Sunday night, Monday morning. It's going to happen in just a very few days. But you know, we weren't thinking much about it. So the risk still seemed very, very low on Thursday at this point threat in South Florida. Even those of us that were looking at this all the time, let alone the public, we weren't paying any attention to this at all. Then Friday comes. And this was the 11 a.m. for another memo, and I put it right there, the key word that caught my eye. Uh, the ridge had been maintained to the north. In other words, high pressure to the north. Uh, a west-northwest, the west track uh, is, is the blend of these models, and perhaps a faster forward speed. But the forecast wasn't really reflecting that yet because the, the model guides really hadn't come completely into line with that thinking. But there was a sense that maybe the pattern had some issues with it. So. Uh, I honestly don't remember how I got that. I remember there was no internet. And so I wonder what it was on the word midday or something like that. So maybe I read that behind the mid. But I, what I do remember so clearly is standing next to this printer. We had this printer that was almost the size of this podium that moves the slowest printer in the history of the world. Like, these maps, right? We got them on. And look in that window trying to see what, what it's going to say. And finally, the uh, the ADN model comes out, we're finally on Mars for it, and upper, um, and not only was this ridge, this high pressure to the north uh, there, but it was the red fine number that you barely see on the printout, it was actually getting smaller, according to that model. And so, in my mind, given the fact that, that nobody was paying attention, and it was Friday afternoon, it all just people go here and there and everywhere, that the risk not the odds, but the risk had gone up significantly. So that was the forecast. Even the forecast was from Monday morning on that Friday. It was still well northeast of the Bahamas, but there were hints in the weather pattern that maybe this was going to have to be adjusted. So that afternoon, uh, I went into my boss at the front of the news bar and I said, we need to change our thinking on this completely. And so starting at after 5 o'clock, we blew out a whole lot of the newscasts and started running hurricane specials. It's a hurricane special. We started talking about do not make plans this weekend without you get the hurricane in mind. I'm not saying it's coming, it's just that the risk has increased uh, dramatically. But it, you know, it wasn't because I knew that it was there. I am not ready for uh, forecasting the hurricane, but I didn't forecast anything. I just got concerned with Friday, the temperament, the, what people were thinking, and this, and it was. Uh, an increase in risk and that was the increase in odds. Then, uh, so it felt, the risk felt significantly higher just because of all these things that were taken care of. And then on Saturday, uh, at that point, the concern of everybody's heart was drastically increased. Uh, there you see here the Cardinal, very good Western Division. So we were confident on Saturday that, that uh, somebody was going to get it. Now again, it wasn't clear to the Remember, it's going to hit something high now. So this is, you know, the whole time frame is completely depressed from, from what it is uh, now. And 
And so there were the models, again, that we cannot see, and I can actually tell, tell you more about what they do. But the forecast, the 40-hour forecast on Saturday and Sunday, was that it was going to be in the vicinity of Oka, and uh, I know you're not small though, but at that point, we were just thinking, okay, decent chances coming from the metropolitan area, and most of the day, starting at 11 a.m. on Saturday, uh, I stood in front of a wall, just a wall, a dormitory actually, and just answered telephone calls for, for about eight hours of that time, plus the newscast, uh, up until 1 a.m. And 1 a.m. on Saturday night, I said, uh, friends, I'm going to go to the now, and I suggest you do too, because uh, tomorrow it may be one of the biggest days in the history of the city, and, uh, and we may not go there tomorrow night. So let's get some sleep, let's come back here in the morning, and we'll see how it goes. So that was Saturday night. Uh, we all got about uh, four hours of sleep, came back, and, and then uh, we did it uh, on Sunday. And uh, we, you know, by 11 a.m., full preparation was required, and we were in one step uh, for the other. The other the uh, hurricane center was, was saying that category four hurricanes now expected very strong language. But back then, it was, it was you know massively strong language. We learned now, and now they, they do that even more so. But back then, that was a very big, really powerful statement to make. So uh, we're going through this, and before I get to what happened at three thirty in the morning, uh, a couple of things happened. There are a few good things, a really good things I said in my life. One, three, most all associated with her hand, but three of them, one in the evening, late evening on um, Sunday night, when we were, we went to a reporter, and the reporter uh, ended the piece out in the field by saying, of course, the folks here are hoping the end doesn't come. And after that, uh, the developer came back and said, we can no longer hope that Andrew is not going to come. Uh, the, this it is going to happen in late now. And the thinking there was that somebody needed to say that full preparation is now required. There's no more hoping it's not going to come. Let's just all concentrate on everything we can do to get through it. And uh, I'm going to go through these three steps because in the end, the point is going to be that people like me certainly had given time to kind of take this. So that's the second thing that should be there. But that was, that was the first one. The second one that occurred uh, about 2 o'clock in the morning was that uh, a book I read by a guy named L. F. Reardon, I highly recommend it to you. It was written after the 1926 hurricane. And he and his family survived the 1926 hurricane in Coral Gables in their home. They were really listening through it, hiding from the dining room table, and, and, uh, and it was fierce. And, and when it got to be just the worst, they scooped up their two kids and they put one of those big uh, laundry tubs in the laundry room and got a mattress and put it over the tub. And then they went and got the car in the garage. Uh, I don't know how to and that madness thing came back to me, and it was not one of the things I thought out ahead of time, but I said, okay, of course, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get a closet cleaned out in the center of the house, and I want you to get a mattress off the bed, and if this continues and this gets really bad, you're going to go in there and you get under that mattress and you're going to come out and tilt it. And I don't know how many people uh, did that, and when they did that, I know that I heard from uh, hundreds of thousands of Andrew that they did that, and they moved the mattress and saw the sky. Well, that was, that was uh, number two, and I just, you know, like, what can we do here as a community as the ultimate thing to do to be safe? And the third thing happened at 3.30 in the morning, after the decision I made about 3 o'clock, was I asked the uh, board director down the studio to find us a place to move to. Because it occurred to me that if we're telling other people to move, I wasn't really crazy about where we were in the house of movement on top of the building under the studio. But the fact was that where we ended up moving in that place that was called the bunker, which was a little storage area on the side of the studio, really wasn't very strong as if the roof of the studio came out, that would have been a bad place as well. But it looked good. And the message there was, oh my god, they're moving. We better take all this seriously. And that turned out to be uh, a very critical moment in the incredible. I showed my sheets there, even though if you look at the little clock on the wall, it says it's great after two. We had a television connection to Bob. Uh, until about 4 a.m. when we lost that, and we had flown after that. But I wanted to uh, put that there because I mean, we could not have done this without Bob and the people at the Hurricane Center, most of which I knew lived south of the Hurricane Center. And Hurricane Center, the building was shaking on the uh, satellite analysis, so they, they, they knew that. But they were just undaunted and incredible, just a uh, tour de force, incredible. So I wanted to. 
sure to, to recognize a lot of the work. There was a moment at 435 when the land radar uh, on top of the Hurricane Center blew off. That was the last sweep of radar as it, uh, it died right there, lying on television. And you see on the right, uh, we had put in a line into the U.S. Long Beach River. So uh, it was a dial-up line, and we were actually one of the staff there, and kind of right now, and we all just sat in the web office and dialed it down the line. And you keep that thing every eight minutes, you have to dial it down. But we could see the storm when, when uh, nobody else could in the media because people put in that line. And it turns out that every backup system we put in, we do. We have a backup system to be able to stay on the radio, we have a backup system to continue to get weather data, we have a backup to the radar, we have a backup communication system out to our troops in the field. And all part of that plan that went on for two years. So uh, the bottom line of all this is one of the many lessons that came out of Hurricane Commander when and folks were there and lived through it and uh, been in the hurricane business since many of the things you deal with is that that uh, uh, that Hurricane Andrew was this legacy that had to change a lot of things. But the WTBJ lesson was that preparation counts. We would not have been there without two and a half years of uh, trying to think this out and, and you know I was kind of with but the fact was that there was a whole team of people that took it to heart and had the television station uh, ready and the connections to the radio station ready because the various powers were working in terms of the radio uh, preparation was the lot of time. But my the other lesson that, that came out of it is that the system needs and communities need somebody to make these decisions. Somebody to think it out and decide that now is the time that, that as a community we've got to think a certain way. We can't sit around and hope anymore. We've got to take affirmative action. What is the ultimate action? And, and make definitive statements about preparedness and not hope that people will buy in the information what they should do, but you know, stick their neck out and do it. It should not be people like me, it should not be television weather people. Yeah, it should be people in government. Should be credible voices that the community identifies with and all television stations. That thing. So it was, uh, it was an incredible time and I learned a lot and we actually know a lot more than her. And thankfully, uh, thankfully we lost uh, only a few people, but I still think uh, think welcome about the 15 people we lost in South Florida. Thank you for having